Good morning. Today, Pastor Peterson will share the message from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 to 7. I will read in Hindi, and Alexis will read in English. Hear the word of the Lord. Yatpi, aaj ke log antikar mein vishwa nivaas karte hain, kintu inhe mahaan prakash kar darshan hoga. Ye log ek aise andhere sthaan mein rahte hain, jo mirtyu ke desh ke saman hain, kintu wo adbut jyoti un par prakashit hoga. Hey, Parmeshwar, to is jati ki bartori kar, to logo ko khushal bana, ye log tujhe apni prasanta darshayenge. Ye prasanta vaise hi hogi, jaise katni ke samay par hoti hai. Ye prasanta vaise hi hogi, jaise yud mein jeetne ke baad, log sab vijay vastu ke aapas mein baatte, tab unhe hoti hai. Aisa kyu hoga? Kyunki tum par se bhari bojh utar jayega. Logo ki peeto par rakhe ve bhari ballo, को तुम उतरा दोगे, उस तुम उस दंड को छीन लोगे, जिससे शत्रु तुम्हारे लोगों को दंड दिया करते हैं, ये वैसा समय होगा जब वो समय था, जब तुमने मिनाशियों को हराया था। The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land and deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the, cross, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. And her wo vardi jis par lahu ke dhabbe lage hue hain nash kar di jayegi. Ye vasve aak mein jhok di jayengi. Ye sab kuch tab ghatega jab us vishesh bachche ka janam hoga. Parmeshwar hume ek putr pradan karega aur ye putr logo ki agwai ke liye uttar dai hoga. Uska naam hoga adbut, updeshak, samarthi parmeshwar, pitachir, amar aur shanti ka rajkumar. Uski raj mein shakti aur shanti ka nivas hoga. दाऊद के वंश उस राजा को राज निरंतर विकास होता रहेगा। वो राजा नेकी और निपक्ष न्याय का अपने राज के शासन में सदा सदा उपयोग करता रहेगा। वो सर्वशक्तिशाली यहूवा अपनी प्रजा से गहरा प्रेम रखता है और उसका ये गहरा प्रेम ही उसे ऐसे काम करवाता है। Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. याकूब इस्राएल के लोगों के विरुद्ध मेरे यहोवा ने एक आज्ञा दी इस्राएल के विरुद्ध दी गई उस आज्ञा का पालन होगा तब अप्रेम के हर व्यक्ति को और यहां तक कि शेमरोन के मुखियों तक को यह पता चल जाएगा कि परमेश्वर ने उन्हें दंड दिया था आज वे लोग बहुत अभिमानी और बटबोला हैं लोग वो कहा करते हैं दिस इज द वर्ड ऑफ द लॉर्ड With that, um, we are going to go into today's passage where we're seeing these four names from the book of Isaiah that describe Jesus in this prophecy, and it says this. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And these are very well-known titles for Jesus that we're well acquainted with. But I think it's important to note that the book of Isaiah was written probably 700, 800 years before the time of Jesus. And then there's 2,000 years after that. So we're talking about phrases and expressions that were used around three millennia ago, 3,000 years ago. There's a lot, of, a lot of time that has gone by between when these words and when these terms were written and where we stand right now. And so how do we know that we're really understanding what Isaiah really wanted to say in each of these expressions? Well, I think one helpful tool whenever I'm trying to understand Scripture is I do this. When trying to understand Scripture, it can be helpful to start by understanding how we define that word right now. 
And this is really a good tool for me when I preach, but really for all of us. Whenever you're reading the Bible and there's a word that you're not exactly sure of, you don't know the Greek, you don't know the Hebrew or the tenses, you don't really need to know that at the start. What you need to know is how do you understand it right now? What does that word mean to you in modern language? Because that's really where you start. And then you can backtrack and understand what it might mean in the Bible. But we have to be honest with, what does this mean to me right now? And that will give us a heads up as to how we might be interpreting it. So that's exactly what I want to do today. I want to look at these term or this name, Prince of Peace. And I want to start off by looking at what are the ideas or the visuals, the images, the principles that come out when we hear each of these words. Let's start with how we understand it. And then we'll compare it to what was actually meant in the original language. So let's start off with Prince. What do we think about when we hear the word Prince? Images, ideas, things like that. If you're anything like me, the main image that pops into my mind is this next one, which is this guy. This is Prince, right? This is kind of, when you think about Prince, uh, it's very hard for me to imagine any other person in that role. But outside of that one person, there's the idea of being a prince. And when we think about the idea of princes, we might think of people like this, Prince William and Prince Harry. I don't know who's who, so you can fill in the blank for whoever that person might be to you. But when we think about the word or the idea of prince, this is kind of the image that we come up with, right? Yes, there is the artist formerly known as prince and then prince and all those different things. But this is what we think about in our minds when we think about princes. We think princes are the son of a king, right? When you're the son of a king, automatically you're a prince. We think about royalty, uh, people who wear crowns and, and things like this, right? That's what princes do. We think about symbols for a nation. Prince William and Prince Harry, from what I understand, as royalty in England, don't actually create or enact laws. They can't enforce them. They're symbols. They're figures for the kingdom uh, of, of England or the kingdom of Britain. I'm not sure exactly what it is. Sorry if that's your, uh, if there's your background. But that's kind of what they do. This is what princes are. They are sons of kings. They are royal figures. And they're symbols for entire groups of people. And so when we read that phrase that Jesus is a prince of peace, we have to understand that in some way we are looking at it through that lens. Jesus is this prince, this son of a king, this royal figure, a symbol, a figurehead of peace. And that's kind of oftentimes how we might be naturally interpreting that expression. But what does that word prince mean in the Hebrew? Well, that word prince in the Hebrew is the word sar. And actually, one of the last translations of the word sar is prince. Before that, it's actually translated as a chieftain, a chief, a ruler, official, captain, and then lastly, a prince. It actually doesn't have anything to do with royalty at all. It can refer to a prince, but that's not its main terminology. That's not what it really means. A sar is someone who gets things done. A sar is in command of other people. The chief baker in Joseph's story is a sar. He is leading other bakers. And in fact, more often than not, more often than when you hear it talked about as a prince or a royal figure who's like waving their hand, it's really a military term. In the book of 1 Samuel chapter 8, it says this. Some he will sign to be commanders of thousands. That's that word sar. And commanders of fifties and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest. And again from 1 Samuel 22, he said to them, Listen, men of Benjamin, will the son of Jesse give you all fields and vineyards? Will he make all of you commanders at sars of thousands and commanders of hundreds? And so you can see oftentimes when that word prince is used in the Bible, it has nothing to do with our conception of Prince William and Prince Harry, the kind of royal figures. Instead, this prince is a commander. Someone who is telling people what to do. That the word for prince is not a royal figure. It is someone who commands and leads. That's what we're saying when we say that Jesus is our prince of peace. When we understand this, this changes dramatically what this expression means and what it is telling us. That calling Jesus our prince of peace is a reminder that he is one who commands and leads. Every time we say that. Every time that, that rolls off our tongues, and we say this all the time throughout the Advent season, in essence, what we are saying is that, Jesus, you are a commander. 
You're a leader. You're a chieftain. And you are a prince. It's not we're saying, Jesus, you are this royal figure. And you wear nice clothes. And you're the son of a king. And you wave a certain way that no one else waves in this world. That's not what we're saying about Jesus. And I think we need to place ourselves outside of that conception. And inside the biblical conception, we are saying, Jesus, you command. You lead. And the natural question that we have to ask if that is true is, in what ways does he do that in your life? In what ways does Jesus truly command you in your life? If Jesus is this commander, this Tsar, not this earthly prince, but this, this commander and this captain, in what ways is he your commander and captain? In what ways does he lead and command you? In what ways in your life do you say, I have to do this? I may not want to. It may not be what other people believe or think. But since Jesus is my commander, I will do this. Because if we're really honest about our lives, Jesus is very close to being a Prince William figure instead of a true commander. Someone we would look look up to. Someone who represents Christianity. Someone we admire. But how often does Jesus have the commanding word in your life? That he could tell you what to do and you would do it in the same way that a general would. That's part of this expression, Prince of Peace. And I think oftentimes it kind of rolls off our tongues. Oh, he's my Prince of Peace. But there's a challenge embedded in this. He is a commander. And so is he our commander? Is he my commander? Or is the commander really myself? Am I the captain of my own ship? That's part of the challenge that we hear in this word, this phrase, Prince of Peace. But moving forward, why don't we talk about that word peace then, right? We have this word prince. It's not the earthly prince. It is this commander and this leader. It's a reminder that Jesus is this commander. And a question that we ask ourselves, is he my commander? Does he really occupy that role in my life? Let's move forward to that other word peace. And again, let's start off in the same way that we did before. Not by trying to understand what they meant in the Bible. But how do we understand this? When we think about the word peace, when we say it to ourselves, what are some of the images or the emotions that come with it? I think oftentimes with peace, we are thinking about a feeling of serenity or quietness or the absence of conflict, right? When you say, I want peace, what are you really saying? I know what I'm saying as a parent. I'm saying, like, don't argue anymore. Don't fight. Just don't talk, actually. Just just be quiet and just give me some peace. Right? That's what parents mean. I know you all feel me, parents, right now. But I think peace for all of us means something like that, right? It means like serenity. It means quietness. It means just no more fighting, no more drama. I just want peace. And so when we think about Jesus being the prince of peace, we put those words together and we think he is this figure, this royal, amazing figure who just gives me serenity in my life. Give me the sense of quiet, quietness, this sense of there's no conflict or drama going on. That is what Jesus is promising me. Is that what Jesus is promising us? Well, that word peace in the Hebrew originally is the word shalom. Shalom can mean the ending of a war or a conflict, but really a better definition of shalom is actually completeness, soundness, and welfare. It's very different, isn't it? From this conception, oh, just give me some peace, right? Be quiet. Stop arguing. Shalom is not really the same thing. Shalom is when things are whole. When something was broken and it's repaired, then you would say it has shalom. For example, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, take along these 10 cheeses to the commander. This is Jesse speaking to David. Take along these cheeses to the commander, and that's the Tsar, the prince of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. That's that word shalom. But Jesse isn't telling David, go to your brothers and ask them, are you quiet? Do you have quiet on the battlefield? Do you have serenity as you face Goliath? No, he's saying, what is your state? Are they okay? Are they healthy? Are they injured in some way? Ask about their shalom. That's what that word means. Or another good example of this from 1 Kings chapter 7. When all the work King Solomon had done for the temple of the Lord was finished, that's the word shalom, he brought in the things his father David had dedicated, the silver and gold and the furnishings, and he placed them in the treasuries of the Lord's temple. When the temple was made complete, 
when the final bricks were laid for it, then it had shalom. It was complete. It was whole. And then it had shalom. And so you see that there is a, actually a very stark difference between the peace that we ask for and the peace, that, the peace that we think about in our lives, about just this quietness and sitting at a beach or by the side of a lake. And the shalom that's talked about here, this peace that we are hearing here in the book of Isaiah chapter 9. One way to kind of illustrate the big difference is the difference between not fighting with someone and being at true peace with them. Because we all know there's a difference between those two things. You could be not fighting with someone, not arguing with them anymore. Maybe you have kind of a a detente between you, a demilitarized zone between you two. That doesn't mean you're at shalom. You might be at peace with that person. You might say, I'm not mad at you anymore. That is not what shalom really is. Shalom is wholeness when something that was fractured has been made repaired. It's been restored instead. And that's what's talked about when it says that Jesus is this prince of peace. Calling Jesus our prince of peace is not a promise for a serene and blissful life, but to a life of restoration and wholeness. That's what we're saying when we say, Jesus, you're a prince of peace. We're not saying, Jesus, I'm going to have a quiet life. My life will be like on the lakes of a shore of a shore of the lake or like being on the beach of Hawaii. That's peace. No. We're saying, Jesus, you are the prince of shalom, of completeness, of when things are broken and they're restored. That's what you are the prince of. That's what you are imagining, not Hawaii, although Hawaii is amazing, but instead of things that were broken being made whole instead. Jesus himself talks about this. He illustrates a difference between what we would call kind of our worldly peace or kind of our conception of peace and his understanding of shalom when he says this in John chapter 16. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. He talks about giving peace and trouble at the same time. And for us it's impossible. We would say, I can't have trouble in my life, but also have peace. We understand what Jesus is talking about is not serenity. He's talking about shalom. I have given you shalom with the Father. You are restored with the God the Father now. You have been reconciled to God. You're going to have trouble, though. He says both of those things at the same time, and we have to process that. Understand, the peace that God promises us is not a blissful, carefree existence. It is shalom. His restoration is being made whole instead. And that's what we're saying when we say that Jesus is his Prince of Peace, that he is giving us this image or this promise of shalom, of restoration, reconciliation, not of serenity. There's one more aspect of shalom that I think is really important for us to understand, and that is this. Shalom is not something that just happens. It is something that we actively participate in bringing about. Going back to our understanding of peace, of just when we want peace, when we're trying to find peace, it really is a feeling or something that happens or is given to us. Give me some peace. Or it's a feeling that we have in our lives. Oh, I feel peace. And so oftentimes in our conception of peace, it's a passive thing. It's something that I receive. I am feeling in my life. Oh, I feel so much peace. It's like a gift that we receive. Shalom is actually not that way. Shalom is something that we make. It is something that we build. And that's why there's actually a verb form of shalom, which is shalom. It's when you're making shalom, when you're making something right. It means to restore, to pay back, to pay restitution, to make something complete, or peacemaking. And so this is another difference between our understanding of peace as something we just receive, because that is not what shalom is. Shalom is something we participate in. A great example of this is from Exodus chapter 22 when it says this, If anyone grazes their livestock in a field or vineyard and lets them stray and they graze in someone else's field, the offender must make restitution or make shalom from the best of their own field or vineyard. If a fire breaks out and spreads into thorn bushes so that it burns shocks of grain or standing grain or the whole field, the one who started the fire must make restitution. That word is shalom again. 
If anyone gives a neighbor silver or goods for safekeeping and they are stolen from the neighbor's house, the thief, if caught, must pay back double. It's that word shalom or the verb form of it, shalom again. And what I'm trying to illustrate here is shalom is something that we do. We make the shalom. We don't just receive it and say, oh, I'm feeling peace. We make it all around us. It's a verb for us to do not an emotion that I simply feel. The other part that I want to be really clear about this is that paying people restitution or reparations in order to make peace in a community has a long biblical history going all the way back to Exodus chapter 22. I'm going to just make that really clear here. And we have controversy about that because we think, oh, that's not fair. We shouldn't have to do that. This is part of making shalom, is making things right between people. And this goes all the way to the book of Luke next chapter 19 when we see Zacchaeus in the town of Jericho. He recognizes in that moment, I've done wrong and I've stolen from people. And what does he say? Does he say, oh, I received grace. Jesus is here. I don't have to pay any of you back. Sorry. No, he says, if I have stolen from any of you, I will pay back not the same amount, which would have been fair, not two times the amount, which would have been the command from Exodus chapter 22. I will pay back four times the amount instead. And I want us to kind of wrestle with this because I know there's controversy about the idea of reparations as if that's not an appropriate thing to do. It is a fully biblical concept that we pay people back in order to make things right, in order to build shalom. That is the word that is used in Exodus 22. When you've damaged someone's world or their life, make shalom. Make shalom. And we need to take this far more seriously And recognize that when we say that Jesus is our Prince of Peace, it's not about receiving serenity from an honored figure. It is a reminder that Jesus commands each of us to participate in the deeper work of restoration, reparation, and peacemaking. That's what we're saying. It's very different. And we take it in this holiday light of saying, Jesus, you're my Prince of Peace. Just give me peace. When in fact what we're saying is, Jesus, you are the commander of shalom. And you are commanding me to take part in this, in this work of shalom, this verb of making peace all around me. That's what we are in essence saying every time we say this expression. And this very much changes what this means to us when we say this word from Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6, that Jesus, you are our prince of peace. We are saying, Jesus, you are the commander to shalom. And if he's a commander to shalom, if he orders us to make peace, The question we can ask ourselves right now is this. What is one way that you can do that? What is one way that you can obey the order of a commander and build shalom in your family, your work, your neighborhood, and in our world? This is what it really means to celebrate Advent. This is what it means to say that Jesus is this Prince of Peace. It is not simply to say, oh, this is an Advent tradition and I want peace in my life. It is to build it. And what an amazing Advent gift it would be if we were peacemakers and not just peace receivers. If in every family that is represented here or online, and every neighborhood in which those families are, and every community that we are, that we build shalom, that we're not sitting there saying, God, give me peace. But instead we say, I will take this order and I will make peace where I go. So that's my challenge to myself and to all of us through the Advent in motion or whatever it might be. Not to simply pray for peace in your life, but to pray for ways to make peace in our lives as well. Why don't we take some time to just let the Holy Spirit do that. Worship team, if you want to come up. But let's just take some time to kind of reprogram ourselves from this Prince of Peace understanding that we have of just this royal figure giving us serenity in our lives. And let's just let the realness of what Isaiah was really saying sink in. He was saying, the commander to Shalom. The one who orders is ordering us to make things whole, to take broken walls and broken cities and make them whole, to make broken families and broken relationships and make them whole, to forgive people, not because we want to, but because the commander has told us to. Just let that sink in for a moment. This is how we honor the Prince of Peace, is by making shalom in the lives and the relationships around us. Holy Spirit, even right now, I pray that you would speak to us, God. Help us to step away and out from 
the usual conception of, of this phrase that we have into the realness of it. We're being commanded to building peace in our lives, Lord. Holy Spirit, right now, show us who that means. Maybe there's a person that we need to do that with. Maybe there is an environment or a location where we need to be peacemakers. But God, help us to take this Prince of Peace in the way that it was intended and see it as a challenge and a command to each one of us to be people of shalom wherever we are. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 